Good to see you. Uh, if you're new, my name's Joel and I'm one of the leaders here. If you're new here, we've been doing a long series of messages from the book of Samuel. And uh, I'm going to read chapter 29 and the first chunk of 30. And uh, we're getting through it now. We're getting very near the end, closer and closer to the end of this amazing book. And uh, I'm going to just look at one aspect of David's career at the very close of the life of King Saul. And I'll read to you from verse 20, sorry, chapter 29, verse... One. Now the Philistines had gathered all their forces at Aphek, and the Israelites were encamped by the spring that is in Jezreel, as the lords of the Philistines were passing on by hundreds and by thousands. And David and his men were passing on in the rear with, the, with Achish. The commanders of the Philistines said, What are these Hebrews doing here? And Achish said to the commanders of the Philistines, Is this not David, the servant of Saul, king of Israel? who has been with me now for days and years, and since he deserted to me, I have found no fault in him to this day. But the commanders of the Philistines were angry with him. And the commanders of the Philistines said to him, Send the man back, that he may return to the place to which you have assigned him. He shall not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For how could this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Would it not be with the heads of the men here? Is not this David, of whom they sing to one another in dances, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David is ten thousands? Then Achish called David and said to him, As the Lord lives, you've been honest, and to me it seems right that you should march out in with, with me in the campaign. For I have found nothing wrong in you from the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the lords do not approve of you. So go back now and go peaceably that you may not displease the lords of the Philistines. And David said to Achish, But what have I done? What have you found in your servant from the day I entered your service until now, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? And Achish answered David and said, I know that you are as blameless in my sight as an angel of God. Nevertheless, the commanders of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Now then, rise early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who came with you and start early in the morning and depart as soon as you have light. So David set out with his men early in the morning to return to the land of the Philistines. But the Philistines went up to Jezreel. Now when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag and had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire and taken captive the women and all who were in it, both small and great. They killed no one, but carried them off and went their way. And when David and his men came to the city, they found it burned with fire, and their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him raised their voices and wept until they had no more strength to weep. David's two wives also had been taken captive. Ahinoam of Jezreel and Abigail the widow of Nabal at Carmel. And David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him because all the people were bitter in soul, each for his sons and daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, bring me the ephod. So Abiathar brought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord, Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake and shall surely rescue. So David set out, and the 600 men who were with him, and they came to the brook Besor, and where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and 400 men, 200 stayed behind, who were too exhausted to cross the brook Besor. Let's just pray together. Father, we thank you for this book. We thank you for the opportunity to gather and we thank you for your wonderful love for us. We thank you especially for your wonderful son, the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that as we look in the pages of scripture today, it will be his face that we'll see. It will be his life that will attract us and draw us after him. And we pray that by your Holy Spirit, Lord, you will cause us to have a bigger and a greater view of our Lord Jesus, and so a, a, a fuller and a greater faithfulness to him and fruitfulness for him, Lord. We pray all these things according to your mercy, in Jesus' name, 
Amen. Amen. Well, David, if you were with us last week, you'll know, uh, has failed at this point in a, in a very spectacular way. He deserted Israel, went over to the Philistines to save his own neck. He was so tired of running away from the king of Israel, which he'd been doing for years, that he thought, well, the best thing for me is to just run away and join this king Achish in Philistia. And now, you don't need a lot of theological background or Bible knowledge to know that. That was a, that was a patchy decision at best. It was uh, very, very unorthodox. And he, he's now come into a world of problems. And as we, we said last week, you can go through life trying to solve your own problems without God's help and only create further ones and usually bigger ones. What we have to realize eventually is that God is the ultimate solver of problems. God is the ultimate authority over everything. And what he wants from us is our trust that we would trust him with the big decisions, that we would hand our lives over to him and see that he's faithful, he's good for his word, he keeps his promises, and if we're facing massive difficulties, he can help, he can sort it out, he can make it good. Sometimes it takes a lot of trust because we can be going through terrible pain, terrible difficulty, but nevertheless, he's good. He's good to be trusted. David had given up trusting, and he created all kinds of real, real hassle. He's now, at the start of this story that I've been reading to you, in the most ridiculous situation. He's being recruited by the king of the Philistines to fight in the front line against his own country, against Israel. That's how far his treachery has gone, and it's, it's awful, and he must have felt terrible. But by the end of this story that I've just read to you, we get David at his very best. It's David back to the David we know, and... Uh, it's, it's just superb. You get him taking tremendous risks, courageously taking his little band of 400 men across to fight the Amalekites, to rescue back their bride and his, his, his children and all that's been taken to go out on God's behalf on a great battle. It is superb. It's David as we know and love him. And, and if, if David was played in a movie, this part would be, have him being played by Liam Neeson. He would be saying to the king of the Amalekites, I don't know who you are, but if you let my wife go, that'll be the end of it. But if you don't, I will hunt you down. I will find you, and I will kill you. You know, they've got Taken 2. It's just coming. You've seen the trailer for Taken 2. It's going to be awesome. It's like proper Bible film. All right, It's a very, very good film. But, but you get this incredible kind of heroic character coming through the page. And what I want to look at today is... is how he's come from being this messy failure to being this heroic rescuer. Because it's like the, the, the problem has been solved. And it's worth bearing in mind before we get into what David does, that God does most of the work. In fact, ultimately God does all the work, really. But in, in, in chapter 29, God doesn't get mentioned, not really, not except as a kind of a blessing word. But he, he is behind the scenes doing everything, pulling all the strings, making it all work out for David. <laughs> I mean, David's just failed. David's not trusted God and he's run off. He's got himself into like the slapstick situation. You know when in the movies or in the cartoons where someone gets glue on their hands and they try and get it off by using their other hand and then they get that hand stuck and they try and use their foot and they get that stuck and then they try and use the other foot and they're, you know, just you know, they're kind of sticking to everything in the room by the end of the scene. David's trying to solve his problems and just getting worse and worse. He's just entangled in massive, massive problems. But here you see God's incredible wisdom, resource, coolness behind the scenes. What does he do? He causes the, the king's other soldiers, the other generals, to show up in his office in the war room and say, uh, about this other Hebrew on the front line, uh, we, David, yeah, we've heard of David. Do you remember, he was the one with the nursery rhyme sung about him, about how he killed tens of thousands of us. Uh, we don't want him next to us. It doesn't look like it's going to go well. God uses these pagan soldiers to persuade the king to boot David out of his army. It's brilliant. It's just a masterstroke. And David, I mean, to, to his... It's hilarious. David almost, he starts arguing. He's like saying, what have I done? What have I done? As if he's like, David, get out. This is your chance. Get out. But he's sort of, I don't know what he's up to in that line. Where he's like testing fate. But thankfully, it's not fate. It's his good father God 
who's protecting him from a disastrous set of mistakes he's made. And the reason I just pause on that before we get into what David's done is to tell you God can get you out of anything. He can get you out of any situation that you've got yourself into. He's well able to. And you may find he's more than willing to as well. The problem we have is that we don't trust him to. So we just get ourselves more stuck instead. You may have found yourself in debt. Many people have during these times of financial difficulty. And what people who are in debt will often do is a classic case, classic case of what people in debt, or how people will tie themselves up in problems. They forget, they throw all that God has said out the window, all the things God has said about looking after your money, being generous, trusting God being a good steward of your money. You start being crazy with your money, either by hoarding everything that comes and never showing any generosity to God, or by jumping on crazy solutions, trying to make money quickly to get out of this trouble. And you get more tied up, you get more stressed, you get more burdened with more and more debt. You know, the biggest and best way out of debt is to just do what the Bible says. Steward your money wisely, which doesn't just mean hoarding it. It does mean saving it wisely, but it also means being generous, giving away. Christians make countless mistakes when they get into debt. Oh, I don't want to give. I'm not giving. We've got a gift day coming up. No, 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 that's not for me. I can't, I'm not, no, no, that's for people who, aren't, who haven't got financial difficulties. Friends, we've all got financial difficulties. What do you do with them? You trust God. You put God first. You expect that God is good for his word. You trust him. He provides our needs. Don't stop being generous in order to solve financial problems. Remain generous. Show faithfulness to God. Good stewardship means trusting God. Trusting God. David's not been doing that. That's why he's in the terrible hassle he's in. What we do is we try to fight against God's way, and God's trying to teach us something. He's saying, until you break and see the error of your ways, you're just going to make more hassle for yourself. It's like yesterday, I'm playing football with my two sons, and uh, I'm trying to instill within my oldest a sort of a, a, an understanding of teamwork. Because like a lot of eight-year-old boys, he doesn't understand that football has teams with 11 players in. He's, he, he likes to hog the ball. And, and I could, he's just saying it out. He's not just thinking it. He's saying it out loud. I want my hat trick. I want my hat trick. I want my hat trick. And his little brother's saying, pass to me, pass to me. He's saying, no, I want my hat trick. He's not even subtle about it. It's like the, the hat trick is the main thing. You are quite secondary. The hat trick is the prize. And I'm trying to teach him. So basically, I start, I play really well. He doesn't, I just won't let him score against me. I'm, I'm on, I'm, it's those two against me. And I just won't let him score. And I'm, trying, I'm saying to him, pass to your brother. He went, right. He went, pass, right, fair enough. I'm just going to stop you scoring. As soon as he starts passing, as soon as he starts sharing the ball, that's when I'll do the dad thing and start playing really badly. <laughs> You know, you know what dads do? Oh, no. Oh, oh, how hard it is. Oh, how difficult. I'm not going to turn that on until you start passing. That's what your father in heaven is like with you. Until you start learning the things he's trying to teach you, he's not going to open things up for you. He's not. He might behind your back, but you won't even notice. He's always good. <laughs> That's what he's doing for David in this story. But David isn't aware. David's oblivious. He's still completely messing it up, actually. And that's why... He has to get to this crisis point in chapter 30, where he comes back after being released from the terrible, shameful situation to Ziklag. And it says, when David and his men came back to Ziklag on the third day, the Amalekites had made a raid against the Negev and against Ziklag, and they had overcome Ziklag and burned it with fire. Wow. Now that's a different kind of move on God's part. God, with his great wisdom, one master stroke was to get David set free from the Philistine army. Now is his other master stroke, although at first it certainly doesn't look like a heavenly master stroke, does it? It looks hideous. His, his wives, I mean, he shouldn't be a polygamist, but just, just hold on for a sec. This is be people he would have treasured. David had a big loving heart, you know. He's lost his his family, he's lost, he's lost his possessions, he's lost his city. This has been the place for him. It's been his home, it's been his security, the place he stayed and built community, hung out night and day with his brothers and companions and soldiers and built a home for themselves. This is our safety, this is our comfort. And we come home and find that God has stripped us of it. 
But this is God's hand. Because God will sometimes resort to something quite dramatic to get your attention. God will sometimes allow something in your life that you've leaned on for support to be pulled away. It's like he'll strip you down. He'll burn your ziklag. Burn it to the ground. The thing that you've leaned on for comfort and safety. You feel, oh, this makes me feel safe. This, I, I, it's like a, a, a security blanket. This is what gives me a sense of provision and security in the world. And God is capable of simply removing it quite quickly, quite suddenly. And what's God doing in David's life? I think David has been drifting, drifting for a long time, drifting away from faith. And God's saying, David, if, if you won't respond to me from tender touches, I'll have to use something more stern to shake you out of your complacency and remind you of your need and remind you that I am your God and I am your rock, your shelter, your refuge. I am what you need. So Ziklag is burned to the ground. God, God, God will do that in the life of anyone who really wants to pursue him. He's prepared to do that. He's prepared to allow things in your life that you've clung to to be burned down. The, the, the problem, friends, is not so much that God, God can take things from us. The problem is that we so easily, listen carefully, we so easily fail to interpret what he's done. We don't see the hand of God in it, and so we fall into despair. Instead of recognizing our Heavenly Father is involved in this process, we, we think, well, the world is against us, and this proves once again what I thought all along, that God is also against me. And so we get discouraged, we get depressed, we, we fall apart. And all the time, God is trying to say something to us. This is why the book of Hebrews puts it so powerfully in chapter 12. It says, my son, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Don't make light of the Lord's discipline. Nor be wary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It's possible for things to happen in your life and God is giving you a crisis it's a horrible thing to go through a crisis normally, but don't waste the crisis. Can you hear me? Don't waste it. It's like God stretching out a hand. Grab it. Grab God in the crisis. Grab what he's trying to do, what he's trying to teach, how he's trying to draw near, how he's trying to show his fatherliness and his compassion to you. You could miss it. Christians often do. They go through shattering experiences and take nothing from them. I don't mean that you can always understand the suffering and the pain and the trial. I don't mean that there's always an easy answer. Sometimes we don't get the easy answer, perhaps until we get to be with him in glory. But I, I'm not talking about knowing why something has happened necessarily, but I am saying recognize God's hand in it. Cling to God in it. Cling. Hold fast to him. And that's exactly what David gets right here. Ziklag's been taken from me. Oh, finally, I remembered. <laughs> I didn't need Ziklag. I need you. A friend of mine was uh, running an orphanage in Burundi around the time of the uh, genocides in the mid-90s. And she, she had a, a man come to her who had lost everything, absolutely everything. I mean, it, but he possessed the shirt on his back. And he looked at her and said, and this is a line that you may have heard me say before, I'll never forget it. He said, sister, you never really know that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. Now, I hope that it doesn't take a, a trial of quite those proportions for me and you to have to learn this. <laughs> I really do. And yet, friends, even if it does... It's better for us to learn that. It's better for us to go through life knowing his sufficiency, drawing strength as David does from God in this story. 
That's his secret. That's David's great genius. He knew his God. <laughs> he really did. He knew how to get hold of him and lean on him. Let's just talk for a second before we close today on how David got strength from God. And before I do that, I want to just point out one or two things it doesn't mean. What does it mean to get strength from God? Well, first of all, it doesn't mean that everything is now guaranteed to go right. That's not getting strength from God. See, you might think, well, if I come to God, that will mean that my whole life, my prosperity, my health, my general happiness will be fixed. Isn't that what God does? He fixes stuff. He's the butler. He's the cosmic Jeeves who sets everything straight. That's his job, right? Well, listen, David clearly isn't living that way because it says in verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke of stoning him. And then it says, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. It doesn't say until several lines later <laughs> that he started to say, now God, shall I pursue my enemies? That's verse 8. Shall I pursue after this band? Shall I overtake them? So the process is like this. First, David finds God to be everything that he needs. Then David asks the question, what about the rest of my life, Father? What comes next? What do I do? Do I, do I get to have my wives back? Do I have my possessions? Do I build the city again? Now, I suspect David had a sneaking suspicion all along that God would probably give those things back because God loves David and God's a good God. But he left it with God. Do you understand? He trusted him. He trusted him. And so he said, ultimately, I want to find strength in you, God. In you. With or without all the other bits and pieces of my life in train, in tow. You can't get a guarantee. If you say, oh, if I come to Jesus, do I get a guarantee that my life will go right? I'm not offering you that, guys. I'm not. And if any preacher ever does, they're preaching a false message. You should ignore them. You should turn your TV off. That's not how it works. You come to him because he is enough for you. He really is. If you don't believe me, it's because you don't know him. <laughs> That's the only reason you don't believe me. I know it's hard to believe. Can one heavenly, weird, spooky person be enough to satisfy my soul and bring me joy and peace and security through life? Sounds a little iffy. The answer is that's exactly what the Bible teaches from start to finish. That's the whole story. He's enough. He's our sufficiency, the Bible says. He's our enoughness. David's found that countless times and he's finding it again. Can I ask you, is Jesus enough for you? And don't answer me straight away, not even in your heart. Don't do that. Think about it. You might want to think about it for a few days. Is he enough for me? What if this happened? What if I never got that job? What if I never got liked by those people? What if, what if I never made the money I want to make? Would he still be enough for me? Would he? That's the biggest question. Is he? Is he? That's the, and if he is, friends, it changes everything. So we, we can't pretend that the answer, finding God, getting strength from God, is for all the pieces of the jigsaw to fall into place nice and tidy. Uh-uh. Ain't going to happen. Not this side of heaven, it isn't. But what does it also not mean? It also doesn't mean just having a good cry. It doesn't just mean emotional experience. I found strength in God. I had a moment in a meeting where I just cried and cried, or, or I, I was praying on my own and just had a tremendous emotional experience, just got, kind of got flushed through. I just, I just had a good old cry. It just feels so much better. I feel so much better now, so everything's fine. Now hear me, that's still important, okay? I'm not saying the emotional part isn't important. God's made you to experience pain and pleasure and to process grief and mourning in a genuine way. Friends, this is very real. It's absolutely appropriate that David sat down and cried, as it says, until he had no strength left to cry. God's made you to, to carry and experience emotions, to process them with him. 
It's so important, friends, that we deal with life in a real way. Jesus was like that. Jesus knew what it was to walk into a place, see a city of lost people before him, and break down in tears. If you say that's not manly, it's because you haven't met the greatest man that ever lived, Jesus himself. Don't, don't, don't push that side away. That's part of the Bible. That's what it teaches. But listen, it isn't the same as finding strength in God. How do I know that? Well, very simply, <laughs> David did that early on in verse 4. Wept until they had no more strength to weep. It's not till verse 6 that it says David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Meanwhile, between those two events, the emotional breakthrough and the powerful breakthrough of finding strength in God, the other soldiers who were also involved in the, in the massive outpouring of emotion, in the you know, steel cage of emotion, if you like, in that very moment, they are plotting to kill David. It says, verse 5, oh, no, sorry, verse 6, David was greatly distressed for the people spoke, which is kind of weird, don't you think? If, if just having a good cry was the way to meet God and gain strength from God, that wouldn't ha- it wouldn't be, they, they would not be doing that. They would not be saying, oh, God, I feel so much better. I really met with God. It's a lovely time of prayer. really met with the Lord Jesus there. Just really rebuilt myself and got strength and... <laughs> Okay, let's close our Bibles. Who's for killing David? Let's kill David, shall we? Of course you wouldn't. No, no, no. Something is missing here. You can have a powerful emotional experience. And I've seen this. You probably have too. And if you haven't seen it, watch for it, especially in yourself. You can have an emotional experience and not change one jot. You can. I've seen it so many times. We watch people in meetings. We have meetings where, oh, did you see? People are crying in that meeting. That's significant. Yeah, it's not insignificant. But it's not the same thing as God changing people's lives. It can be a part of it. It can be a sign of it. But it's not the same thing. Be careful how you judge people's emotional shilly shallies. You hear my heart? You hear my, what I'm saying? This, friends, be careful. There's something more to press in for than a few tears. Much more substantial. So it's not just emotion. Neither is it just fellowship. In fact, David's got no one to fellowship with. The only people he's fellowshiping with want to kill him. That's not fellowship, by the way, just so you know. That's not community. That's not the kind of church we're trying to build. His best friend, the guy that he got real fellowship with, he hasn't seen for years, Jonathan. The guy who used to come and strengthen his hand in God, he's not around. So he's left on his own. So again, listen... Some of us, we equate meeting with God with just fellowship with other brothers and sisters, other people, other pastors. I need to go and see this person, talk about my problems. I need to go and see that person, talk about my problems. I need to go and see her or him and talk about my problems. Fine, talk about your problems, but don't pretend that that's going to change it. They won't take your problems away. You've got to meet with God. You've got to find God in it. You've got to get strength from God. As a pastor, you learn this. You see people taking their problems to you, and you tell them what to do, and you say, well, this is how to work this through. Let's pray. Let's talk. Let's, let's talk about this, and maybe we'll talk about it again in a month's time. Then you find out they went to see another pastor <laughs> a couple of days later, and then another one. They work through the whole eldership. You think, well, you, were you, if you're really interested in meeting God, you wouldn't soak all the elders dry. You'd go to God. You'd do what the first elder said. If it doesn't work, come back. But go to God. I trust it will, it will work anyway. So you can't just be fellowship. Jonathan's not around. It's not even just prayer. You might think, well, what's the, I think I know what he's going to say. The answer is that you pray. You pray and you read your Bible. Pray and you read your Bible, everything will be fine. Mm, Not quite what I'm saying. You can pray and read your Bible and still you know that you're looking for more in God. You're trying to meet with him. You must pray and read your Bible every day. You must. If that feels legalistic, shoot me. You've got to. You've got to. It's like breathing. Sorry, if it's a bit legalistic. To, what, you want me to eat every day? Have a dinner every day? A bit legalistic. Yeah, okay, fair, I'll call me a legalist. You need to meet God every day. But, friends, you know the difference, don't you, between having a moment of prayer 
and pressing in to get strength from God. You've got to, you know, you've got to eat your solids. You've got to have your staple. It's a bit like, you know, you've got to have your dinner, but you need water as well. <laughs> you need food, but you need something else in your diet too. There must be these seasons of pressing in. It's one of the Puritans, William Gurnall says, it's a little bit like prayer, going to communion, listening to a sermon. These are good things, but they are servants of Jesus. They are not Jesus. Because you're listening to this sermon, some of you are going to kid yourself and think, oh, it's all good now. I've sorted it. It isn't necessarily. It may be a piece of it. I pray that it is. That's always what the preacher wants. But it's not the answer. Gurnall is saying, you've got to press in past the servants. You know that lady with the issue of blood in Mark's gospel? There's a story of a lady who was hemorrhaging. She couldn't get well. And the disciples are trying to push people away, trying to push people away. And she's been going to doctors and everybody. She can't get healed. She says, if Jesus walks by, if I could just touch him, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be well. And some would be satisfied with just getting close and having a look. Some would be satisfied with having a chat with one of the disciples. One of the apostles. These are the men. These are the in crowd. I hung out with Peter. I hung out with Andrew. I hung out with James. I hung out with John. (laughs) That was an amazing day, wasn't it? She'd say, yeah, but I touched Jesus. I got through to Jesus. I touched his garment and something came out of him. Some power came out and I can walk upright again. My life is back to normal. Praise God. That's what you need, friends. You've got to find Jesus in the prayer and in the scripture and in the sermons and in the communion. All these ordinances, as we might call them, are vehicles. They're tools. They're not God. They're servants of God. Find God in them. Yes, in them. Don't say, well, I've got to find God. Throw my Bible away. That's useless. I tried prayer. Now I just chant. Now I just stare at waterfalls. That's better for me. Ah, don't do that. Keep pressing on with the ordinances, but don't give up on them till you meet God and find strength there. Because that's what people say. They say, well, I tried praying. It doesn't work. I'm in a real crisis, real problem situation. I tried praying. It didn't work. What kind of praying did you do? What prayer did you do? Do you think God doesn't care about you? Do you think God casts people off who call out to him? That's not the God that this book speaks of. No, friends, it's because you you didn't press through. You didn't press through. You didn't expect him to speak to you. What does it say about David here? It doesn't just say David found strength in the Lord. Full stop. What does it say? Look at it carefully. Verse 6, David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. That's a big word, his. See, you can just relate to God as the the God of the book, the principles God, the textbook God. What does the textbook say? It says that, okay, that's apparently what the the boss up there says. There's a boss behind all this. You just need to know, new Christians, there's a boss behind everything. Friends, he's not just the guy dishing out principles. He's your God. He's your companion. He's yours to know. He's willing to be yours. He's willing that everything he is, he is unto you. He's a father. He's a companion. He's a fountain of living water. He's a meter of needs. He's a rock. He's a fortress. He's a shelter. He's a a shade in a dry desert. He's cooling streams. He's a rescuer. He comes like thunder and lightning across the sky to rescue. These are are all quotes from the, the songs that David himself wrote. These are things I'm saying. David knew him to be my, he's my God. He's not just out there. He's not just, there is some cosmic force that keeps the universe going. Or Apparently there's a God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and you can learn about him in the Bible. Friends, he can be your God. Yours, really yours. To know, to press in and know (laughs) what could be better. What could, I defy you, what could be better? You tell me, what could be better than knowing him? And knowing him even in the crisis can be sweet. Even in the disappointment and setback and hurt, it can be precious because it's real. David's not having anything less than real. We know that about him. He's not a religious, smart Alec. 
He's, he's a real person with real scars. <laughs> he's a poet and a warrior. He wouldn't put up with religion. I've got to know him. I've got to find strength from him. I've got to press in and know him. And so he would have dwelt on the promises. How did Jonathan strengthen David's hand in chapter 23? It says he came to him and he promised him. He said things to him. He reminded him of the promises. Friends, that's another secret. Hear me. You remind yourself. You get hold of scripture and you, you read it. You meditate. You slow down in it and you say, Holy Spirit, speak these things to my gut until they come out of my very pores. Till this is a part of me, this book. So it feeds my soul Holds me fast. That's more than just a few verses just rushed along. Oh, yeah, I've got to do my, my Bible reading. No, no, you're, you're drinking, you're finding promises and you're latching on like a leech. You're sucking them dry. How can I hold fast to God in this trial? I've got to go to the promises. I've got to go to God in the promises. That's what he's doing. Getting strength from the things God has told him to do. Otherwise, it's just textbook. One of the things I learned from Arthur these last few weeks, was that he did this. He really did this. He's just a boy, just 17 or 16, I can't even remember. Only been a Christian a year. Massive crisis in his life. Brain tumour. Terrible for a teenage boy. Terrible. And what, what does he do? I mean, at first, he's very honest. He said, I just fell apart. Just used to cry every day. I didn't know what to do. I was just panicking. Panicking. He cried as if he had no strength left to cry. But you, if you got to know Arthur, which I had the privilege of knowing him a little bit, just a little, much, some of you knew him much better than I did. I'll tell you this. He knew how to strengthen himself in God. He really did. He did it brilliantly. I mean, everything on Twitter, Facebook, every, I was, if there was a verse on my Twitter page, oh, Arthur's been on Twitter. Just constant, just verse after verse. And this isn't him saying, I'm doing my memory verse, Pastor. Just so you know, now, this is someone facing death. Memory verses aren't for impressing people when those are the stakes. He's feeding his soul. He's getting strength because he knows the enemies are real. There are real zigzags. There are real crises, friends. There are real, aren't there? There are hideous things that come our way. You've got to get strength in God. You've got to find him. Not religiously, but press into him. Take these scriptures and let them hold you fast. It's like Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. With all of his brilliance and greatness, he knew that he could get proud. And so God gave him this. We don't know what it was. We don't, no one knows what it was. God gave him this thorn in the flesh. Could have been a disease, could have been a difficult person. We don't know. It was something horrible in his life that caused him endless pain. And he tried to get God to take it away. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, listen carefully. He says, Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Here's the thing I want you to notice. Paul doesn't just say, I pleaded with God to take this away, but then I remembered the memory verse. My grace is sufficient for you. That's not what it says. That wouldn't work. The key words are those four in verse 9. He said to me. In every person that has gone through a great storm and proved God in the midst of it, there are those words. He said to me. I just know. He, he said in the midst of the storm, I heard his voice. That's what the storms are for, friends. They're chances for you to hear the voice of God. Moments where you know it's not just about keeping up appearances and just going through religious motions and yeah, taking my bread and my wine and just... It's, I'm clinging to him, and he's speaking to me. And I heard it. I, I tell you, brothers in Corinth, guys, it's real. Because this thorn is horrible. Whatever it was, blindness, people say, I don't know, eyesight problem. Maybe he was bent over double from so many beatings and whippings. Who knows what he went through? It was agony. This is a horrible, horrible complaint I've got. But I found his strength. Do you know why I know it's there? Because he spoke to me. I heard his voice. Have you heard the voice of God? 
You might think, oh, how can anyone hear them? Come on, that's for religious people. That's for people who really are spectacular saints. They're the ones that get to, you're just talking about Paul and David and these are the heroes. Wrong. They're people like you and me. The only thing they needed was a priest. That's how David does it. It says he got Abiathar, the priest. Come, come. I, I need to get access to the Father. I need to get access to God. And you say, well, I haven't got a priest. <laughs> how do you find a priest? In, 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 you know, I mean, a Jewish high priest, slaughtering animals and all the rest. We don't do that in England. How do you get to God? You come through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, when he died upon the cross, he was offering up his body and his blood as a sacrifice so that anybody could come and have access. Not the super, uber spiritual people who are off the chart spiritual. Anybody can come because Jesus has paid the price. You say, how do I find God in crisis after crisis? How do I get strength from God? How do I keep being generous when I'm in debt or in during recession? How do I keep trusting him in this situation, that situation? How do I do it? We've got a gift day coming. How are we going to get through that? By our strength, uh uh-uh, don't go there. Go to Jesus. Go to Jesus. Find him good. (laughs) You'll have to press through to get to him sometimes. But don't give up. He will meet with you.